Welcome to another episode of Imagination TV. Can't believe we're already 10 weeks into this. Episode 48 featuring a keynote for Cancelled Not Cancelled and the theme of this week is Know Yourself. Today I'm fortunate enough to have two co-hosts with me. Sharice Jackson, how are we feeling? Very, very excited and nervous. Um, It's my first time co-hosting but I'm really looking forward to being on the show today. What do you want to get out of today, Sharice? Um, I guess I just want to just hang out with you all and get to, you know, see this side of it and yeah, learn, learn what it takes to, to host the show. <laughs> yeah, we, um, for everyone watching, we're trying to calm the nerves behind the scenes before this went live and we we're, were just like, you know what, guys, it's just a phone call. We're all just having a yarn. So super happy to be here today to be alongside you all. We've got an incredible lineup and Sharice, do you want to maybe kickstart this by introducing who you are and how you came to AIM? Yeah, sure thing. Um, thank you for that. I have been a part of the AIM story for a very long time. I actually was a student um, in the AIM program. So I started in year nine and graduated in year 12 with 100% attendance. I absolutely loved AIM and going to every session. Um, so I graduated in 2016. I then decided to come back the following year to mentor. So I volunteered my time for a year um, working with the kids in my community. So I'm from Western Sydney. Um, and then that, the year after, I then applied to be the program manager for the same site that I had grown up in and mentored in. And I was successful and was then a full-time staff member working with nine schools in Western Sydney. The year after that, so that was 2019, I actually applied to be the co-CEO and was accepted again and got to shadow um, Jack and Benny at the time and got to see what it took to be a a CEO of a company and got put in board rooms with um, very high powerful people and went to parliament house and went to America and got to do all these really cool things 
And then this year I am the center manager for UCID, so working on the older side that AIM has. And today we have um, our other co-host on the show, Chloe, who is one of the students at UCID. Would you like to introduce yourself, Chloe? Hey, what's up? I'm Chloe. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask with Girls High School. I'm in year 12, finishing my HSC this year. Yeah. And Chloe, what do you want to get out of the show today? Uh, I just want to understand everyone and listen to everyone's passions about literally ev everything and the fact that everyone's imagination and just knowing what they want to be when they're older or what they want to do in the future kind of gives me an input on what I really want to do and connecting with others. And Chloe, what is that? What do you want to do when you finish school next year? Um, I'm not really 100% sure, but I've always been an animal lover. I'm doing a TAFE course, uh, so two in animal studies. I'm on my second year. It's, it's amazing. I'm so pumped to work with animals. That's awesome. We've had some, some comments coming in from the YouTube line. Penny has said, so excited for this, and then has also left another comment after that saying, hell to the year. Sharice, Rianne and Chloe, how's that power trio? Grace Douglas has said, girl power. We've got Parul saying, happy reconciliation week, everyone. Stoked to hear Michael's story and the history and legacy that he carries. So perfect segue, Cyril, Parul, into what we've got coming up on the show for you all today. So we have Michael Yunapingu, who's going to join us for a keynote. Before we get into that, let's speak a little bit about Reconciliation Week and what this week means to us. It, it runs from the 27th of May until the 3rd of June. And the theme this week is In This Together. National Reconciliation Week is a time for all Australians to learn about our shared histories, culture, the achievements and how each of us can contribute to achieving reconciliation in Australia. Sharice, what does Reconciliation Week mean to you? Um, I think, yeah, well, exactly what you just said. It's about everyone coming together um, and working to towards a, a reconciled, um, you know, Australia for, for all of us to be a part of and feel comfortable in um, I think the most important thing, and I heard it last year when I was on a panel um, with Shirley, I forget her last name, from um, the Go Foundation, and she said it's good, like it's all good to have a, a rap plan and, you know, say that you have it, but it's not good enough just to bring it out twice a year to four, four weeks like Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC Week. Like you need to be working for towards it all the time. Um, so, yeah, I think reconciliation isn't something that we can just talk about one week out of the whole year I think it needs to be a continuous process throughout the whole year until you know we all come together as one yeah I love that idea of you know linking that back to the theme of all in this together Chloe what does what does all in this together mean to you it means a lot of things like understanding your strengths and weaknesses the passion and fear of everything that everyone has knowing our abilities and desires and really knowing what we want to do yeah, a hundred percent. And I think you know now is a perfect time for for this theme, um, for everything that's happening in the world. And I think it's just a great chance for us to to remind one another and to remind ourselves that whether we're in a crisis or not, um, or whether we're in reconciliation, that it really is on all of us to be in this together. And on that note, you know, we last week launched the Zimbabwe fundraising to be able to get to the to Zimbabwe to reach more kids and most importantly, to be able to support them on the ground. And we, last week, um, I was lucky enough to give Siri a call, who's going to be leading the program there, to, to offer her a six-month contract to get that going. And I am just so incredibly excited that, that we were able to do that. And I thank each and every one of you for, for donating and for putting your hand up to support this and know that the program's begun. We're already looking at radio and TV options over there. And, yeah, I'm super excited that, in Australia, we can be all in this together, but also around the world and globally. So thank you all for your support. Therese, we've had an incredible lineup on Imagination TV this week. We've had Nelson Mandela's granddaughter, the former PM Malcolm Turnbull. We had Federal Shadow Minister for Education and Training, Tanya Plibersek. We've had co-hosts every day that are leading this TV show alongside Jack and that are stepping up and I suppose really showing that there is no shame in in being proud of who you are and being proud of your identity and being proud to lead and today we have Michael Yunapingu who's going to take the keynote 
I think before we jump into to the next segment, I just wanted to to quickly get your idea, um, Sharice, on on what you think of Imagination TV and how this is going to be impacting kids around the world. Yeah, I think the Imagination TV is it's so great. It's giving people the ch- or young people a chance to be in this world. Um, you know, even for yourself and I who have never come from this like TV world, and now we're on this show and I'm getting to learn the, the behind the scenes and the process of everything and even giving Chloe the, the opportunity to be on the show. She's been on twice, three times now. Um, she's just a natural at it. She jumped on and told us what to do. So I think we're giving young people the stage to rise up. And um, yeah, I think that that's what AIM's always been about is giving young people the stage and we're continuing to do that through this time of, of um, COVID. So yeah, I think that's what we're doing well on the show. Um, the next thing, though, that we're going to jump to is our wizard. Um, so today we have Sean Primrose, who is a Victorian-based um, visual artist who's going to do 180 seconds of wizardry. So let's go. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Primrose, and I am a visual artist from uh, the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. I've been painting for about eight years now. Um, I started enjoying art in high school when I had an incredible uh, art teacher and mentor uh, called Jenny Mann um, who really inspired me to um, take art a little bit more seriously. Today I'm going to be teaching you how to uh, paint and pot your own little pot plant. So what you'll need is a pot um, so you can use whatever size depending on the size of your plant. Um, So I use terracotta pots because they're um, easy to get and the paint sticks really well to them. You'll also need paint. So I use acrylic house paint because it sticks really well and also um, can be used like indoor and outdoor. But if you don't have acrylic house paint, you can just use like any paint or Posca marker or whatever. Um, You just have to like keep the plant indoors uh, or else the wind and rain will destroy it. Um, You'll also need like an old t-shirt just to wear so you don't get paint on you. A paintbrush, so um, a bigger one to paint like the undercoat and then a smaller one to paint little details on. Gardening gloves, uh, potting mix and also um, can use a hair dryer um, to make it dry quicker if it's not like sunny outside. I will now do a little time lapse to document my process uh, and then show you the finished piece. So if you'd like to uh, make your own, that would be amazing. Um, you can even uh, message me a photo of it when it's done. I'd love to see. Uh, my Instagram is at Sean Primrose Art. got your painted pot uh, you have to get out your gardening gloves uh, your potting mix and uh, your plant so I've just chosen this um, off cut of a succulent in any room of the house. I hope I have inspired you today. Can't wait to see what you create. Um, if you have been inspired by me and want to make your own pot plants, um, show me on Instagram and make sure to tag me uh, in your work. How good. I um, I actually follow Sean on social media and saw that she'd created some pot plants the other day. Thought it would be incredible for a wizardry segment and didn't realise she was going to be on the show today. So I'm going to have to re-watch this so I can create my own pot plants and, and get creative with that. Today, we've had some incredible comments coming through the chat line. Sharice, this is one for you. Maddie Ferguson has said, Sharice is actually my auntie, best auntie out, no cap. Not sure what that means. Think it's a good thing. Brendan Newton has said, great point about reconciliation being every day. Hannah James has said, shout out to the powerful ladies leading this from the front today. And we've had Dan Single in capital say, love this panel, reconciliation going to come. Thanks to you, young, intelligent women like y'all, bravo. I said y'all because he's in America at the moment, well, I think, and that's how Americans speak. Um, next up, we have our keynote speaker. 
Um, Michael and I actually met maybe back in 2014 at a summer camp in Sydney and it wasn't until recently when we reconnected for this TV show that we realised that we'd indeed crossed paths before and throughout the last 12 to 24 months I've been fortunate enough to attend the Garma Festival with AIM running the Youth Forum and Michael plays a huge role in in that festival and last year he he did a speech for the opening ceremony and I want to read these two excerpts that I've that I've written down today because I think it just sums up who he is perfectly and so the first one was I balance two two different worlds that are sadly not treated the same we have the opportunity to assist each other and to create a better future and the second one was I try to be a leader in every way possible but I don't want to be this person or one big leader I want to create different leaders in a community and motivate people a whole clan group of people a whole generation of people that is stronger than just one person Michael Yunapingu you've been an absolute role model to not only myself but to hundreds of young Indigenous leaders around the world and hundreds of people look up to you and I know I'm absolutely fortunate enough today to be sharing the stage with you and I'm going to hand over to you um, to yeah to give us a keynote and to speak about what know yourself means to you and yeah I am thank you so much for your time and over to you Michael Yunapingu. Thank you appreciate that um yeah I was uh you know it's been really really good knowing you over the years and um I'm glad you reached out and uh yeah I'm glad to be on the show so let's start off um we're saying, you know, we, we all live in not just one one, one world, but uh, many worlds. Uh, we have family, school, work, and personal lives. And these all come together and are integral parts of everybody's lives and make up something special for each and every one of us. So what I said in my language is, my name is Michael Garingoi Yenepingu, and I am a um, Gomaj man from the Yolngu Nation, Yolngu um, group, and you're listening, you all listen to my story. So two worlds, something I hear a lot about and something I've grown to understand and acknowledge. I hope a story about my life can help uh, everybody listening uh, to motivate them and to, um, I hope that you can all learn from it, learn something out of it. So my story evolved around two worlds growing up, uh, so that's white law and Yolngu law. I was born in Adelaide and grew up mostly in the city, completing all but one year of education uh, over there and one year of education um, in Nulumbwe here. Um, my mother is from Adelaide, uh, South Australia, and my father is a Gumaj Yolngu man from Northeast Nanaman. Like most kids, I had many dreams. I wanted to become an AFL player, make the Olympics as a runner, be a P teacher, and many more. But as life went on, there were many obstacles that got in the way and life lessons, paving the way to what I achieved and making me who I am today. After finishing high school in 2015, I had many choices. One of them was going uh, was to return back to Nulumbwe, where my family are from. But my mother helped enrol me into university to study, uh, uh, to study uh, the Bachelor of Human Movement. As we both acknowledge, this was my interest area, even though I wasn't really keen on studying at the time. I hated my first year of university and had no idea what I wanted to do. I was playing footy for an under-18 development squad in the SNFL, but I had a very disappointing season and eventually got dropped. My interest in footy plummeted and I quit. My second and third year were better. I decided to switch to Bachelor of Exercise and Sports Science stream. I also switched sports to pursue running. My personal achievements were making it to the Nationals in the 200 meter sprints. Getting dropped in footy made me want to prove to myself that I can work even harder in another sport. Thinking back at it now, switching sports 
to turn at a high level in running uh, and improve my work ethic considerably in life. I actually worked a lot harder than I did in footy. During these years, I also had a few casual jobs, uh, coaching many footy teams and uh, uh, many boys and girls footy teams. And um, I also got an Aboriginal cadetship at Adelaide Coates Footy Club. Uh, my degree consisted of many placement opportunities and I gained a considerable amount of confidence and talking in front of people. Balancing studies, placements, running and work was a huge challenge, but I'm very grateful to opportunities that gave me and grateful for all the really um, incredible people I met. Anyways, I passed and got through university, but by the end of my studies, I got homesick and wanted to return back um, to my community. Every year, I would fly back to Nulamboy, uh, go to see my family and to also play footy for a bit of fun. But now I couldn't bear it any longer and wanted to come back to live again permanently. Many people questioned me why I would have uh, moved back. I had it all in front of me. A career working in the AFL industry was definitely something I could have pursued. Some even can encourage me to give footy another shot. But to me, I realised I enjoyed helping people and had developed many leadership skills that I picked up from a combination of school, university and sports that I felt was much more important to me and could make an impact in a much more winning, meaningful way to a community that needs it. Straight after my graduation ceremony in mid-2019, I packed my bags and returned home. My role now is the project officer in Gunyanara, my homeland, and coordinator of the youth centre. In my time back here, I put in all my efforts towards giving my community better pathways and outcomes in as many areas as possible. Most of my time is outdoors, spending two days a week, only spending two days in the week of, of in the week in the office, which is planning and engaging stakeholders uh, with helping my community. I also invest myself heavily with sports. Right now I'm balancing work and managing and playing for our community team, football football club. My aim with our team is to make it more than just footy, but to make players be role models in the community and assist daily activities with the youth in our community. Whilst working back here, I've learned a lot more than what I thought I would. It has motivated in me in different ways compared to the lifestyle in the city and led me to decide on taking other pathways. One of these pathways was to continue on even more with studies. And in about a month, I'll be starting a master's in teaching online. This is something I actually thought I'd never do. It has made me realize that I love learning new things. Not only do I enjoy learning, I love challenges and want to keep learning to help my family and community. It also made, made me realize the passion I have for footy, something that I haven't thought about taking, to, taking seriously since my teenage years. I'm not too sure what people think of me and how they perceive me to be. As I grow older, the less that I face myself. Personally, I describe myself as a very competitive person that loves winning and more importantly, bettering myself. It is almost like an addiction Many times throughout my childhood and teenage years, I would look at famous athletes such as LeBron James, Usain Bolt, Mo Farah, and other successful athletes and study them within my own time. Their dedication and hard work towards something that they are passionate about inspired me to con and contributed towards my overall work ethic. In general, there have been many pathways that I wanted to take, and all, and all of them I've trained really, really hard and tried as hard as I could. More times failures hit me than success, whether it be through academic tests or sports, but it has taught me and played a huge role in something I've succeeded in. I remember when I was 19, I broke 50 seconds for the first time in the 400 meters. I remember collapsing into my coach's arms and crying because I worked so hard to break that barrier. I came last in that race, but it still didn't matter to me. It was the best I'd ever ran. And that meant much more to me than beating other people in that race. So, a few weeks ago, I was asked to make a speech and connected to about knowing myself. Something that many people don't know is that I've had to go through a lot to actually know myself. Being from a mixed background, white and young, as a young kid, I didn't truly really know who I was. I don't think I really acknowledged 
I was either a Yolngo or I was white. My father would speak Yolngo, my dad, our language Yolngo, to his family around me, but I wouldn't actually understand what he would say because he would only teach me and my brother English. My mother couldn't teach us and brought us up mostly by herself. From seven to 15 years old, I didn't have any contact with my father's family. There were a few reasons for this. At the time, I don't think uh, my dad's family really thought too much about us, but I always had sports and other opportunities that distracted myself. From the age of 14, my dad's family reconnected with me. And since then, I've had to relearn my language by myself. This is something I hated to this day, which I'd never thought, uh, wish I never wish I had to go through. It felt lonely and at times frustrating, but it always, uh, I always kept at it. To this day, I don't hold any grudges anymore. My father and I are now like best mates, and I'm also much more confident in speaking my, uh, my language, which has come naturally over the years. One person that I can say that has pushed my mind towards this mindset is my partner. She has taught me to look at life differently rather than by how I've always known it from my failures, successes and pathways. She has been, always been a great support and encouraged me to learn more about my culture. And she speaks her language fluently and also teaches me her own language. She can speak a lot more of my language than I can speak of hers. So I think I've got a lot more, a lot of catching up to do, uh, but she has got an unfair advantage because she grew up here uh, probably more than what I grew up here. Another person who has taught me um, some lifelong lessons uh, from a different perspective is my grandfather, uh, my mother's father. For somebody who achieved a lot throughout his life, uh, with a Bachelor of Science and a Diploma in Teaching and being a big figure in education in South Australia, he stayed humble and always looked for the best in anyone, no matter what background they're from. He's probably one of the most understanding and intelligent people I know, and I'm grateful I spent a lot of my childhood with him. In many ways, his presence throughout my life has taught me to keep bettering myself without comparing myself to others. Anyways, I think spending a lot of time, a long time away from language, culture, and your lens for other pathways does take the true meaning of life. It can be difficult to explain, but achieving whatever I've achieved in the past, personally, has not meant as much to me as learning about myself. I see many Indigenous people from all over Australia that have achieved great, great things. But chasing those dreams and ambitions has taken them away from something that is pretty much who they are and what they and part of their DNA, their own culture. Living back in my community has humbled myself and put me back in my place in many ways. When we do Bapuro, so Bapuro means ceremonies, we'll do the same bungal. So bungal is like our dance. We'll dance as one to the rhythm of the clapsticks and yidaki, the didgeridoo. And we all mourn as one. When we go hunting, everybody has a role in spearing a fish, watching out for baro, crocodiles and providing nakba to our families, food. No one is better than the other person. We are all equally the same, but we all have different roles for achieving something for our family and community when it's our time to. That's how I see life. My role is to keep pushing for two-way learning and assisting as many people in the community to achieve something they want to be. For most young more students, an education through a normal schedule, uh, through a normal education system is not what will get them to have the same opportunities as other students. It actually sets many of us and many of my family up for failure. As throughout their life, they've grown up with a very different way of life, growing up in, in the Yolngu community. A system that is so strong and based around Yolngu Roman knowledges and integrated with Western education is what will be beneficial for the future. And I want to be a part, for, a part of pushing for better outcomes in those areas, whether it be through sports, schooling, or simply being there as a role model. No matter how far people think I've made in education, the balance of Yolngu and white education was much more white focused. And that is something I found out wasn't the best way, but can be an experience of my life that can help the future of 
my family and other uh, Ilmuri. Being on the ground every day, pushing for change motivates me. There are many days I felt like quitting, but I guess that competitive nature always brings me back each day to try even harder and make better decisions and efforts which can benefit the future of my community. My community means so much to me and it will always be a part of me. Some people have asked me, what are your plans into the future? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? In recent years, people have let, led me down uh, very different pathways. Most of these pathways I deep down didn't like doing. Some people have told me I should go into politics, be a businessman, be a leader, be a young leader that everybody can follow. Follow my granddad's footsteps, study this and that, be a certain image for a particular audience of people. But all of this can be a lot to take in, especially for a young person. At the end of the day, I think I'm only, I am only 22, so you know, I'm still finding my own feet in this world. There was one thing I enjoyed when I was a kid, and that was sports. I loved footy and athletics and became so, in, in, so fixated on both sports. It got me through some very difficult times and saved me. Chasing a career and being so focused to not fail later on in life brought myself away from that fixation I had on sports. And the successes I had in the career side of things led to other people wanting to, have a path, wanting to pave a pathway for me. So what do I want to do? Well, I love helping and playing a role in my community. I love continuing to learn about my culture. I love doing bongo. I love going out bush. And I've found the love for playing footy again. So whatever in life involves all of those, I'm happy with and content with. And that's what I want to do. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Michael. I love how committed and really just amazing on how everything that you've grown up with and accepting today and for the past that you're such a big role model. Um, and I love how connected you are with your sport and culture and that you've forgiven and forgotten, but you're you and I'm really, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do have a question for you. Um, apart from your parents that have motivated you, what is one thing that has motivated you the most? Um, just having a challenge, like I enjoy, a lot, I enjoy challenges and um, yeah, challenges have always motivated me and got me out of bed to, you know, keep pushing for it. And, you know, something right, right now, something that motivates me is just, you know, being being a good role model and um, having kids in the community look up to somebody and not just me but also you know help um, other people my age or older or whatever be role models to um, kids and yeah that's it, you know my, my my community motivates me every day you know like I come I, I wake up every morning and I just look around like you know makes me proud of who I am and um, yeah that's what motivates me my community <laughs> yeah thank you so much for sharing your story for being brave for pushing for change and for being a leader that all of us can look up to Michael not only you know our indigenous brothers and sisters but anyone around the world and whether you're indigenous or not like the the messages you convey are just inspiring and they make me want to you know to go out and to change things and to to be the person that can stand up and lead so thank you so much we do have heaps of questions coming in the comments line um tom wensley wants to know what drives you to to know yourself um well here i the elders in my community um you know i've i've get told a lot of stories about, you know, back in the day, what it was like and, you know, what, uh, you know, a lot of stuff about my own culture and um, that sort of stuff. But that, that, it, 
that drives me a lot to keep learning. It, just, it makes me proud of who I am and, um, you know, drive, every day it drives me to, you know, keep learning and, but not just keep learning, give back to, you know, from what I've learned in life. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm still young. I've got so much to learn still. And, um, but, yeah, that's, I enjoy I enjoy helping other people out and giving back, but also enjoy learning every day. And that's, I think, I'm not sure why, but I think, yeah, I, I think it's something that I've grown into a bit. Um, when I was younger, I kind of thought, oh, you know, I don't need to do this, so I don't need to do that. But as I've grown older, there's, there's things that, you know, I, I, I continuously want to keep learning throughout my whole life. So, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And we've had um, Anna Lee on the comments line ask, what advice you would give a young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kid to help them navigate the world in which they live um, to cultivate a happy and fulfilling life for themselves? Um, balance it out. Like, you know, something I, I got really unhappy with was, you know, being in the city for a long time and being away from, you know, some of my best, my, you know, family who were, you know, my best friends, you know, my cousins and um, that. And, you know, it, was, it, it, it got lonely and I felt isolated and different. And um, as I said before, like, I literally had to learn all my language off of, my, off of a dictionary because I didn't have any of my family around. So, um yeah but it's it's balancing it out and you know whenever you, you have the opportunity go go back to you know where you're from and reconnect you know and it, it keeps you grounded in many ways and um you know it makes you proud of who you are you know it's uh, in this day and age i see a lot of people that do forget who they are do forget um who they are and you know that that's not really I think that's something a, a big chunk of your life that you need to have <laughs> yeah for sure well thank you so much Michael you know I said it again I'm gonna say it another time um your words truly do inspire me and I am honored to be able to have you on the show today so thank you so much for your time for sharing your story Jack the, the guy who normally hosts this show is commenting right now saying all class bros. Um, so no, you've got mad respect from him too. And yeah, we're, we're just grateful to be able to have you. So thanks for, thanks for being brave and for sharing your story. And Sharice and Chloe, do you want to take yourselves off mute and let's just give Michael a three person round of applause while we're on live TV. Yeah. All right, Sharice, how do you think that went? Yeah, that was, that was great. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you, Michael, for jumping on and being so vulnerable and talking about walking between those two worlds because I, I think it's so important and balancing um, out everything. So, yeah, thank you for, for jumping on and yeah, being so vulnerable and, and opening up to us. I really appreciate that. And, yeah, I think the show was great, Ree. First time hosting. How do you think you, how do you, think you went? What's, what have you learnt? Um. My biggest thing is like, sometimes I can't pronounce words the best, so I get fixated on words, but you know, you just got to move on from them. So I think that's my biggest learning today and yeah. take it easy. It's all fun. Like this is, this is cool. This is my job. I get to jump on here and, and chat to people and yeah, it's great. Love it. And I think, you know, as Michael just said, then he's only 22 this year and I know you're around a similar age and I've just turned 23 and Chloe's in year 12. And if you look at today's show as, the expectation of what we would want this to be moving forward, which is young black leaders leading. Um, and so thank you to you and to Michael and to Chloe for jumping in and for, for giving this a go today and for, yeah, for leading with bravery. So I think that wraps us up for today. Um, know that we're all in this together and yeah, let's, let's keep moving. Let's keep reconciling and let's keep leading. Catch you crew. Yeah.